Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to today's Conservation Reserve Program informational meeting where we will present information about the 2022 CRP general signup taking place from January 31st to March 11th. On today's agenda, we will be discussing why CRP, why now, eligibility and enrollment, soil rental rates, the ranking process, eligible practices, establishment and management, and other related topics. On the average farm, regardless of location, 20% of the farm loses money, 20% of the farm breaks even, and 60% of the farm turns the total profit. This is according to Dr. Michael Swanson, an ag economist, uh, where he also says, not all ag ground is created equal. There are things that farmers can do to improve the quality of farmland, including tiling and management. Still, the quality of the land is the most important key for obtaining profitability. Farmers who want to be the most successful operators long-term will farm only the best ground and will stay off of the poor ground. 60% of the ag ground in the United States produces 100% of the profits. 20% breaks even on an ongoing basis and 20% of the farm fields consistently lose money. Those statistics hold true across all markets, whether the corn is $2 or $4 a bushel, because the price of the inputs and the price of the farmland will adjust itself to make that true. Farmers face the challenge of making a living from the land while protecting our natural resources through sound farming practices. The key to meeting this challenge successfully is a plan for managing all the farm's resources. Often environmentally sensitive field areas are also the least productive acres. Soil erosion, um, protecting topsoil by taking highly erodible land out of crop production and putting it into some sort of program like the CRP program is one option. Soil erosion on cropland is of particular interest because of its on-site impacts on soil quality and crop productivity and its off-site impacts on water quantity and quality, air quality, and biological activity. Dust contributions to the atmosphere and delivery of sediment, nutrients, and chemicals to water resources are primary environmental concerns. In this picture, you can see runoff, um, you know, in putting in place these conservation programs to filter the water and reduce sedimentation will ultimately improve water quality by controlling runoff and sediment and associated pollutants. Farming more acres does not necessarily mean making more money. The quality of the land is the most important key for obtaining profitability. With high corn prices, some farms thought they could raise crops on marginal land. Many times though, Poor farmland will not make an acceptable return on investment for the grower or the operator. In this picture, you can see some poor soils um, where we could identify some field areas with soil limitations that are not consistently profitable and target those areas to use conservation reserve program practices. Machinery management decisions should also be considered in field operations. Often odd field shapes, obstacles, or contour farming will require operators to increase the complexity of the machinery maneuvering. This usually reduces machine efficiency and crop input efficiency. In this picture, you can see um, some odd areas of these fields. You can use conservation reserve program practices to square up fields and reduce point rows to ease up equipment operation in hard to farm field areas. Some other areas you can consider on your operation are field edges. Partial enrollment might increase farm income by reducing input costs on less productive acres. The last photo here shows the first 20 rows of production from a cornfield with a shelter belt that ran along the edge of the field. 
This is a great visual example of how the judicious use of conservation programs can actually increase farm and ranch income by reducing input costs in a production situation where the landowner ends up upside down on costs and profits. The moral of the story here is to stop farming unprofitable acres. An Iowa farmer mentioned there were five acres where we were losing an average of $280 per acre each year, according to a submission he put in the Corn and Soybean Digest. One thing you need to ask yourself, are you farming in the red? Successful farmers know that keeping unproductive, hard to farm acres in production can hurt their farm profitability. When you consider the impact of soil limitations and crop budgets, it makes sense to quit growing crops in areas that lose money every single year. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. What is it worth to you? Here's an example of a 35 acre field with five years of yield monitoring data for corn and soybeans. Warm colors, red, orange, yellow, indicate areas with lower yields. CRP is like a safe investment. It gives you a guaranteed return for 10 years, kind of like a long-term bond or CD. Whereas raising crops can be more like investing in the stock market. Higher potential returns, more volatility, but things don't always go the way you'd like. If you watched our CRP informational meetings in the past, you've heard us say this before, and we use this saying a lot, but farm the best and conserve the rest. We are in the process of holding landowner informational meetings like this one across the state and meetings across the country. However, due to uncontrollable circumstances, this year we are not doing any in-person meetings, but we are doing these virtual presentations where we will host some Q&A sessions afterwards uh, to answer any questions you may have. We want to help landowners interested in enrolling in CRP increase their odds of being accepted and understand how the decisions they can control will impact their CRP score. Depending on your reasons for enrolling land into CRP, you have a few options as to how you can increase your EBI score. Much of your score, though, is dependent upon things you cannot control. Things like how erosive your soils are, what type of slope you have on your ground, or if your land happens to be in a conservation priority area. We will discuss that later in the presentation. One thing is for sure, a high score will be needed to get enrolled in this highly competitive signup. So hedge your bets and get as many points as possible. Again, general signup takes place from January 31st to March 11th, 2022. Whether you are looking to enroll CRP acres for the first time or have CRP acres and are looking to re-enroll, you really need to just sit down and figure out what are your farm goals. Conservation planning is a fundamental starting point for maintaining and improving the natural resources that support a productive and profitable agricultural operation. Whether your goals are to increase farm income, conserve soil and water, establish wildlife habitat, or secure your farm's future, there's likely an option for you to consider. This CRP presentation is directly geared towards the CRP General Sign-Up 58, which again takes place from January 31st to March 11th of 2022. We will also be including some continuous CRP sign-up information, which is Sign-Up 57 and started on October 1st and is currently ongoing. Grassland CRP sign-up 204 will run from April 4th to May 13th, 2022. We will go over some more in-depth information later in this presentation. The information listed on this slide shows you where to go to find the virtual meeting links for our Q&A sessions we plan to host on February 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. 
If you can attend one of these sessions, we will hopefully be able to answer any questions you might have regarding this presentation and the upcoming sign-up. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jana ingerson Maz. I'm a specialist in the Nebraska Farm Service Agency State Office in Conservation Programs. Today, we're gonna to discuss CRP eligibility. A few of our topics include producer eligibility, land eligibility, the general sign-up process, and our transition incentive program, also known as TIP. There are many possible eligible producers for CRP. This slide includes a listing of what type of individuals, entities, partnerships, or governments may be eligible to enroll into the CRP program. FSA does have to consider some criteria for owners to be eligible for CRP. The first criteria is has the owner owned that land for 12 months before the close of a general sign-up or 12 months at the time an offer is made for continuous CRP sign-up. Possible criteria could be if that owner has acquired land by will or succession as a result of a death, or if the producer has acquired land under other circumstances other than placing it into CRP as determined by DAFP. Deputy Administrator for Farm Programs. Operators may also be eligible to enroll into the CRP program. In order for an operator to be eligible, all of the following must be met. That operator should have operated the land for 12 months before the close of a current sign-up period for general and CRP grasslands. The operator must have also operated the land for 12 months before submitting an offer for continuous sign-up, and satisfactory evidence must be provided as determined by county committee that control of that land is going to continue uninterrupted for the CRP1 period. The following bullet points list reasons why ownership requirements may be waived. The first option would be if the farm was leased with an option to buy, and the producer operated that farm for more than 12 months, then purchased the ground. The second bullet point would be if the producer owned the land for more than 12 months, purchases additional land, and combines with other farms. The third bullet point would be if that producer has owned the land for more than 12 months, lost the land in foreclosure, and regained land through the right of redemption. This slide also contains other items to take into consideration when ownership requirements may be waived. If that land was acquired from an immediate family member within the 12 month period, if land was sold on contract for deed and the original owner repossessed the property, if that land was sold and the original owner regains title through foreclosure proceedings after the new owner files for bankruptcy, or if that land was owned, owned by a joint venture or general partnership, of which at least one member has owned half of the land. A producer's adjusted gross income is also considered for CRP eligibility purposes. If a producer's AGI exceeds $900,000, they will not be eligible to receive any type of payment or benefit in the CRP program. All contract shareholders that are greater than 0% share on the contract and including members of any entity, must provide an AGI certification. This certification is based on the fiscal year the contract is approved. The certification is also binding for the life of the CRP contract and must be obtained and loaded prior to contract approval. FSA will also consider cropping history on that ground. The purpose of CRP is to take ground in, that had been cropped and now put it into a conserving purpose. So in order for eligible cropland to be included and enrolled into CRP, it must include both of the following. The land has to be planted or considered planted to an ag commodity during four of the six crop years. The period we look at now is 2012 through 2017. That land also has to be physically and legally capable of being planted in a normal manner to an ag commodity.
Planted and concerted, considered planted to an ag commodity includes land on which the producer received crop insurance indemnity payment for prevented planting, or land that is considered conserving use and considered planted for crop history. What is conserving use when we consider CRP? Conserving use is considered planted for cropping history purposes when that acreage has been planted 2012 through 2017 in any type of alfalfa, multi-year grass or legume or summer fallow. Or we may possibly have to look at a longer rotation from 2006 to 17 to verify if there's a planted alfalfa, multi-year grass, legume or summer fallow. Or it could be any land that's previously been planted to a CRP cover, it may have expired, but that cover continues to be maintained as though it were enrolled into CRP. Just a note on land that was previously enrolled in CRP. If that land was previously enrolled into a CRP contract and it expires during the crop year 2012 through 2017, and the grass cover continues to be maintained as though enrolled in CRP at the time of the offer is submitted. Note, cover that's deteriorated or degraded is not considered to be maintained and will not be eligible to be designated in con as a conserving use, so therefore will not be eligible for CRP enrollment. Field margins that are incidental to planting of crops, like turn rows or field borders, are also eligible to be offered. Note that if county committee has determined that acreage has been planted in an unworkmanlike manner, it will not be considered planted for copying history purposes. Here is an example of different crop rotations that can be accepted in CRP and a few that would not be eligible. Land has to be shown to be approved at production rotation four out of the six designated years for eligibility. When production crops such as alfalfa are involved, nine and 12 year rotations can be considered eligible as long as there has been evidence of crop rotation. Please be sure to check with your local FSA office for these circumstances. Below are items that may be considered an eligible acreage for CRP. If acreage has been permanently underwater, federally owned acreage, any acreage that has a federal restriction or easement on it, acreage that might be enrolled in another federal program that is established conservation cover already on it, such as CSP, EQIP, GRP, or WIP, any land that is currently within a practice lifespan enrolled in another program would be considered ineligible, land already enrolled in a CRP contract would be considered ineligible acreage, Existing grass waterways are not eligible, or land where the producer is required by law to perform a practice or faces an enforcement action would not be considered eligible. These slides are going to discuss land eligibility for general sign-up. For land to be eligible for ranking during a general sign-up period, FSA has to consider if it will meet one of the below items. The first being erodibility. The land must have a weighted average erodibility index, which we call EI, of eight or greater, or the land must be expiring CRP, which means it's currently enrolled in a CRP contract and is set to expire September 30th of the current fiscal year, or that land must be located in a conservation priority area, CPA. What is the general sign-up process? The first step would be that the producer contacts their local office and expresses an interest in the general sign-up. FSA will discuss with the producer possible practices and the acreage to be enrolled. This chart provides the practices that are eligible to be offered during a general sign-up period. It also provides a description of what those practices are and the contract length. Step two, FSA will determine producer eligibility and land eligibility as we discussed on the previous slides. FSA will then take that information and enter the offer into our Terra system. Terra will determine if that acreage offered meets one of the following land eligibility categories. 
Again, we have to have an EI of eight or greater. The land must be located within a conservation priority area, or it must be expiring CRP in order to be eligible for general CRP. If land does meet at least one of these categories, the offer is then uploaded into our conservation online system. This slide contains a map of the conservation priority areas in Nebraska. Anything within the purple area would be considered land in the CPAs and therefore make it eligible for general CRP. CPAs are comprised of water quality zones, air quality zones, and wildlife zones. This map is a map of Nebraska's water quality zone. And Nebraska also has wildlife zones as highlighted in the tan color on this slide. The third step in the general sign-up process is that FSA must discuss with the producer what the EBI or Environmental Benefit Index score factors are. NRCS may also assist with this and to determine what the producer would like to enroll as a habitat cover. There are six categories. N1 factor would be our wildlife habitat cover benefits, which can score up to 100 points. N2 are our water quality benefits from reduced erosion on that ground, which can score anywhere from zero to 100 points. N3 are what the on-farm benefits of reduced erosion would be. N4 are the enduring benefits. N5 are air quality benefits. And N6 is our cost factor, which is really determined by the producer if they're willing to take a lower rental rate. Once the producer has decided if they want to increase his or her points, FSA will then enter that information into the offer system. FSA is going to enter the point score for the mix based on the number of species the producer has chosen as their habitat cover. We're going to enter the cropping history what the producer shares will be on the contract, what the producer's offered rental rate will be. The county office must also discuss the EBI score with the producer to make sure everybody is on the same page. The fourth step, after the producer selects the desired offer and options and is satisfied with the offer, FSA will print the CRP2 and the CRP1, and the producer will be required to sign and date both the two and the one. Note that only one producer signature is required at the time of offer submission. The CRP1 is the contract that is signed between FSA and the participant, and the CRP2 is the worksheet that summarizes land eligibility, EBI ranking factors, map data on the soils, rental rate calculations, and cropping history. Step five, after the signup period is ended, which signup 58 will end March 11th of 2022, FSA will then analyze and rank all eligible offers. The National Office will determine what the National EBI cutoff score will be. A list of accepted and rejected offers will be provided to the FSA state offices and county offices. Step six, FSA county offices will notify local producers of accepted or rejected offers. Step seven, the producer must notify the FSA local office if they want to proceed with the offer within 30 days of notification in step six. And that notification can be either verbal or in writing to the FSA office. Once FSA has received notification from the producer they would like to proceed with their offer, NRCS is going to develop a conservation plan. They will work with producers to develop a plan that fits their needs. They will also obtain producer's signature on that CPO. Step nine will be that NRCS provides to FSA the signed conservation plan and all supporting documentation, and also the 52 form, which is our environmental survey form. Step 10, FSA must then complete their portion of the 52 form. FSA will review the conservation plan and all required documentation. FSA is going to also ensure that the AGI certification is filed and recorded in subsidiary for any producer that has a share greater than zero. And by September 30th of 2022, the local county committee CED will approve the contract and load it into our system. Step 11, all accepted contracts for CRP sign up 58 will begin October 1st of 2022. 
Just a note, if a producer decides to modify their offer, offers can be modified at any time prior to the end of sign up, which is March 11th. It's important that both the producer and county office be in complete agreement about what that final offer includes. If a producer chooses to withdraw their offer, it's permitted to withdraw an offer before the close of sign up. But once that sign up period is ended on March 11th, it is not permitted to withdraw the sign up. If a producer does decide to withdraw, it needs to be a request in writing to the county office. Annual rental payments for CRP general sign up. FSA does base our rental rates on the relative productivity of the soils within each county and what the average dry land cash rent or cash rent equivalent is in the county. For general sign up, the total rental payment amount is limited to 85% of the county's average soil rental rate. This slide notates 2022 average rental rates. The maximum weighted average rental rate that a general sign-up offer can get is $240 an acre. The maximum weighted average soil rental rate for continuous sign-up is $300 an acre. And just to note that those max rental rates do include the new climate smart incentive factors and 10% inflationary productivity factors that were enacted last summer, 2021. This slide contains an overall view of Nebraska's CRP average soil rental rates. In black will be the county's average rental rate. The red is the 90% continuous average rental rate and 85% general average rates are listed in blue. This slide breaks it down to average rental rates for the general CRP. In general CRP, the average rental rate is an 85% of the soil rental rate plus the 10% inflationary factor. Note that this slide does not include any of the 3 to 10% possible climate smart incentives based on practices in each county. This slide contains the continuous CRP average rental rates for Nebraska. These are 90% plus 10% inflationary adjustment but they do not include the possible 3 to 10% climate smart incentive based on what practice the producer chooses. Once an offer has been accepted, producers with acceptable offers may begin establishing that cover immediately. But note, those who establish any cover before the actual approval of the CRP contract do so at their own risk. General CRP participants may harvest the current year's crop even when normal harvest occurs after the effective date of October 1st on the contract, and that first year payment will not be affected by the harvest date. CRP annual payments are made in arrears, so a participant will get their first annual payment in October of 2023 for any of the sign-up approved contracts under General Sign-Up 58. Transition Incentive Program. TIP was created in the 08 Farm Bill and gave $25 million to help transition CRP land from retiring farmers to beginning farmers, ranchers, and socially disadvantaged farmers or ranchers. It was continued in the 14 Farm Bill and added an additional $33 million, and they also added veterans to the definition as an eligible TIP producer. And now in the 2018 Farm Bill, $50 million has been authorized for TIP producers through fiscal year 2023. The 2018 Farm Bill did remove the requirement for transitioning from a retired or retiring owner or operator to the transition maybe from any owner or operator on a CRP contract to be eligible for TIP. It also allows for certain conservation and land improvements, including prep to plant and ag crops, and begin a certification process under the Organic Food Production Act in 1990 in the last two years of the contract period. This was previously only allowed in the one last year of the contract, but now can, be, can begin up to two years prior. Enrollment in TIP is on a continuous basis until the funds authorized for the program are exhausted. 
beginning, including veteran or socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers and CRP participants may enroll in TIP at any time during the two years before the scheduled date of CRP contract expiration. In this section, we'll be going over the Environmental Benefits Index, or EBI. FSA will rank offers according to the Environmental Benefits Index. The EBI ensures that the most environmentally sensitive acres are selected relative to cost and all offers are considered fairly. All offers are ranked nationally after all EBI scores are in and the sign-up period is closed. Offices will not know the cutoff EBI scores until the sign-up is over. Here is a list of the six EBI factors. Of the six EBI factors, the three categories listed here are the only ones that can be influenced by landowners' decisions. In one, wildlife benefits. Certain cover types significantly increase the point score for this factor. In four, enduring benefits, as well as N6, which deals with cost. Under the N1 wildlife factor, points are awarded for cover practices and habitat improvements. By choosing a higher diversity option, a producer can sometimes increase their EBI score markedly. Consult with NRCS and technical service providers for species selection options. Other added activities under the N1B subfactor can increase your EBI score as well. N1C is not something that can be influenced by the landowner. Under the N1A subfactor, significant points can be added by selecting a higher diversity mix among the practices with the most diverse options. For the CP25, rare and declining habitat restoration, keep in mind that all species must be native to the site for where they are being placed according to ecological site description data. Consult your local and state NRCS rare and declining habitat design procedures for number of species required, species suggestions, and species composition. For the CP42 pollinator practice, follow your local and state design procedures and planning sheets for species composition and requirements. This chart covers the range of possible points for different cover types. Consult NRCS and FSA for additional descriptions. Further details are provided in the following slides. A landowner can also influence their EBI under the N1B subfactor by selecting either wildlife food plots or pollinator habitat. A note, annual food plots must be completed every year at the expense of the producer with no cost share. Failure to plant approved cover crop can lead to violation of the CRP1 and is subject to cancellation of the contract. For pollinator habitat, follow your local and state planning sheet and design procedure protocols for number of species, composition, and other details. By choosing to take a percent under your maximum payment, you can be rewarded with additional EBI points up to a maximum of 25 points for at least a 15% voluntary reduction in your annual payment. Producers should consider what amount of annual payment they can accept being paid under their maximum as determined by FSA when considering this option. Selecting practices, you can note that CP stands for conservation practice. These are the types of cover that you can plant on your enrollment. Under the CP4D, there are two options. When planting a stand of native grasses, trees, shrubs, or forbs, you can receive 40 points for a minimum of four species or 50 points for five species. A wildlife conservation plan is required for all CP4D options, including CP38E4D. If you have dealt with signups in the past, you may notice that CP10 is no longer an option. This example is for tall grass prairie rare and declining habitat. Species composition may vary for your local rare and declining habitat zones. CP25 often carries the highest EBI points Although it should be considered that all species in the mix must be native and establishment challenges need to be taken into account. We will not know the cutoff for EBI in your area until after all offers are in and the signup is closed. Adjusting your EBI points after the signup close will not be allowed. Let's go over a quick example. Say you have 100 acres of CP1 that you want to re-enroll. Under scenario one, the participant can offer the existing cover as is and hope their EBI ranking is above the national cutoff score. Under scenario two, the participant can convert the cover to a 50 point native mix under a CP2 or CP25 for N1A, offer 10% of the acres as pollinator habitat to gain additional points under N4 and N5B subfactors. You can see that under scenario one, the producer received a total of 13 points, 
while under scenario two, they received a total of 100 points with an 87 point difference based off their decisions. Producers should discuss the necessary process they will have to go through to complete this upgrade. Consult your local NRCS or technical service provider for details prior to choosing this option. Now we're going to talk about the continuous sign-up options that are available in the Conservation Reserve Program. With continuous CRP practices, you have a lot of options here um, that are very site-specific. Uh, here's a, a list of examples, um, you know, mainly buffer strips, filter strips, um, you know, things where you're going to be able to, to put on the land that, that have a, a place, a very specific place. That, that again is going to help um, reduce erosion, uh, enhance water quality, and, and of course um, make better wildlife habitat. With continuous CRP, uh, the big requirement that's needed uh, in order to be eligible is the right cropping history, uh, where the land must have been cropped four out of the six years from 2012 to 2017. CRP contract ex expiring or have expired in the, the years of 2017 to 2020 are eligible. With continuous CRP practices, uh, you do receive some incentive payments. The sign up incentive payment uh, is a one time payment of 32.5% of the yearly annual payment. And the practice incentive payment, which means 50% of the actual eligible cost to install the practice. Um, so those those payments should help out with with a lot of the you know seed costs, for example, um, you know renting a drill, things like that that need to be done to, in order to install the practices. Migratory bird safe is open until February 18th of 2022. This wetland safe practice is a potential option for certain focus areas in Nebraska. Uh, the shaded green areas there on the map, you know, again, a great, a great option um, for those of you that have, you know, maybe some wetland areas, playas that, that um, hard to farm, uh, probably losing money on it. You know, a great option to, to uh, make everything work there with migratory birds safe. The uh, Clear 30. Uh, Expiring CRP may be eligible to enroll into a 30-year Clear 30 contract. Um, but that's another new um, option here with the new farm bill, where it, it might make sense to enroll land um, that that isn't very farmable or, or, or hard to farm. Those those odd areas um, where they're better off left as, as habitat. Uh, wellhead protection area practices are are also part of the continuous CRP signup. Um, offered cropland must be with a wellhead boundary in order to be eligible. So a quick example of the signing incentive payment, uh, the landowner annual payment is $100 per acre. That landowner would receive a one-time SIP payment of $32.50 per acre. With the practice incentive payment or PIP payment, uh, this is only for new land being enrolled Again, it's a one-time payment, like the SIP payment, 50% uh, of the actual eligible cost is what this payment is consists of. So and they kind of break it down here a little bit. 40% of that payment is paid as certification of major component or practice installation. And then the other 10% will be paid at the time NRCS completes a status review not later than two years after certification that all practices were installed to determine the cover is fully established. With the practice incentive payment or PIP payment, uh, this is only for new land being enrolled. Again, it's a one-time payment like the SIP payment. 50% uh, of the actual eligible cost is what this payment is consists of. So and they kind of break it down here a little bit. 40% of that payment is paid as certification of major component or practice installation. And then the other 10% will be paid at the time NRCS completes a status review, not later than two years after certification that all practices were installed to determine the cover is fully established. Now we'll try to dive in a little bit more on the specifics of and, and some examples here of continuous practices. 
Uh, the first one is filter strips um, or CP21. Uh, these are 20 to 120 foot wide uh, strips or buffers along seasonal or perennial streams, permanent lakes and ponds, and most wetlands. These uh, filter strip practices can also be uh, piggybacked with the Nebraska Buffer Strip Program if you so choose and is eligible. That might be a good way to help with uh, establishment costs and uh, even, even some better uh, rental rates. The next continuous practice we'll touch on is the HELI program or Highly Erodible Land Initiative. Uh, this is a fairly uh, popular program uh, with the continuous CRP. Uh, these CP practices available uh, for land with an EI or erodibility uh, index of 20 or greater. So, I mean, we're talking about steep land, we're talking about, you know, poor soils, uh, and there's several different options uh, to choose from with what kind of cover types uh, that you're, that you're looking for out on the landscape. With the uh, heli, uh, the SIP and PIP uh, incentive payments are authorized for new land enrollment. These would be 10-year uh, contracts. And I uh, did want to mention that uh, existing grass or other perennial stands uh, not currently enrolled in CRP are not eligible for the Haley practice. With continuous CRP, there are also uh, wetland restoration options and, and programs to enroll into. Uh, CP23 or CP23A, which are floodplain and, and non-floodplain -flood programs, this is where you can enroll cropped wetlands and the adjacent uplands as a buffer. Uh, with CP23, uh, which is in the floodplain, uh, you're allowed up to a three to one ratio of upland to wetland habitat to enroll. Uh, with CP23A, uh, which is non-floodplain, you're allowed up to a four to one ratio of upland to wetland habitat. And in order to be eligible uh, for wetland practices with continuous CRP, a uh, big thing is they need to be in the, located in the right areas uh, with the right um, soil types, hydric soils, for example. Uh, habitat buffers, or also known as quail buffers, uh, are continuous CRP practices, uh, CP33. Uh, these are 30 to 120 foot habitat buffers planted along the field edges. This practice would be a great option, uh, again, for those uh, areas where maybe there's trees along the edge that are, again, not, not the best cropland, um, poor soils, you know, things like that. Another, another good option to have here. Uh, these practices would need to be at least five acres uh, to enroll. And I do want to mention that whole pivot corners uh, are also allowed to go into this practice. Pollinator habitat, or CP42, uh, is an option with continuous CRP signup. It's also an option in the general CRP signup. With the general CRP signup, uh, pollinator habitat can be used to enhance EBI points or offered as whole field practice uh, with limitations to acres. If pollinator habitat is going to be used as a continuous uh, practice, the offers are eligible for those SIP and PIP payments uh, if it's new crop ground going in. In the general sign-up, uh, pollinator habitat does not have maximum acreage limit, but if you were to use pollinator habitat uh, in the continuous sign-up, uh, the offers are limited to 10 acres per tract or 10% of the cropland on the farm. So again, as a continuous option, uh, we're trying to gear that more to, to be site specific. Uh, if there are those areas on the farm that are maybe they're poor quality, uh, can't, hard to farm, uh, hard to get to, things like that, these could be great options uh, to have pollinator habitat. Here we have prairie strips or CP43. Uh, that's an option in the continuous CRP sign up. This is a newer program. Um, these strips are intended to work very similar to terraces, buffers, waterways, uh, things like that in a, in an ag field. 
These strips would be 30 to 120 feet in crop fields that make up no more than 25% of cropland area per field. Uh, unlike uh, most terraces, waterways, uh, things like that, uh, prairie strips uh, are meant to be diverse perennial vegetation uh, consisting of many different wildflowers, legumes, things like that. And they also uh, will reduce soil erosion, improve water quality, and provide quality wildlife habitat. The beauty of this new prairie strip program is that it, for the most part, it's very flexible uh, practice that can be used in many different areas uh, in, in ag fields. These strips uh, located through the field, you know, they can be wider in some areas, a little bit more narrow, uh, just as long as that average width uh, does not exceed 120 feet. Or, or that maximum width, I should say. These strips can be used um, where you would normally have a grassed waterway. Um, pivot corners are eligible as prairie strips uh, if those pivot corners address soil erosion or provide water filtering. Uh, filter strips or buffer strips are also allowed as an option for prairie strips. Uh, strips through the field. Um, for example, strips through the middle of a field uh, could work as cross uh, wind trap strips. These areas are intended to protect water quality. Uh, prairie strips are not eligible on actual terraces, constructed terraces, uh, but they may be placed where a terrace would be placed out in the field, in the, the channel of a gradient uh, or level terrace, or planted between terraces, for example. And lastly, uh, field borders uh, are, would be eligible as prairie strips as long as they address erosion or water quality. Uh, so all in all, I mean, this again, this is a great program uh, to help out with any of them odd areas or buffer areas um, in, in fields and just a great tool to be able to have to, to fill those gaps. And, and again, provide quality uh, wildlife habitat, enhance water quality and again, reduce soil erosion. These next few slides will talk about other programs and incentives uh, to help make better conservation on the farm. Pathway for Wildlife uh, is a local uh, state program, and uh, there's three program categories that make up this program. We have Pathway for Grassland, which could consist of rangeland, wasteland, pasture land. Uh, we have Pathway for Precision Agriculture, uh, which would consist of cropland and cover crops. And we have pathway for community habitat, uh, which would consist of parks, schools, retirement centers, things like that. With pathway for wildlife program, uh, the highlights consists of no cropping history, uh, which, is, which is definitely something uh, you could look at if, if you didn't have cropping history and, and you wouldn't uh, meet CRP requirements, for example. Um, you would get an annual payment option with this program, uh, incentive payments, 75 to 100% cost share, and one to three year contract. So for the most part, just another tool in the toolbox, a uh, very uh, flexible program uh, that can be used in a lot of, lot of areas. If you have uh, projects falling within the green counties, there on the map, it looks like it's the north central uh, part of the state, um, these, these counties can receive an additional $30 per acre for selecting a moderate to high diversity seed mixture uh, for general CRP seedings. And, and this is just another great option uh, to help with, with cost share to, to make better, uh, more quality habitat on the landscape. Uh, and again, those are uh, projects that are north central almost the northwest part of the state that would have this opportunity landowners interested in earning additional income on their land should consider enrolling in the nebraska game of parks open fields and waters program or ofw ofw is a voluntary program that provides annual per acre payments to private landowners willing to allow walk-in hunting access on their land annual payment rates vary depending on the habitat types enrolled and the location of the property High quality CRP fields are typically valued at $8 per acre, 
and other adjoining habitats can be enrolled as well. Landowners that participate in OFW may be eligible for additional financial incentives designed to help offset the costs associated with planting or managing your CRP acres. All properties enrolled in the Open Fields and Waters program are then displayed in the Public Access Atlas publication that comes out each fall prior to the hunting season. The Open Fields and Waters program provides a number of different benefits to private landowners. As I mentioned before, participating landowners can earn additional income on their land in the form of annual per acre payments. Another huge benefit is a liability protection. Landowners that enroll in OFW are afforded liability protection through the Nebraska Recreation Liability Act. Hunters are only allowed access <coughs> by walk-in only. Driving vehicles on OFW lands is prohibited. Game and Park staff post boundary signs around all properties enrolled in the program and conservation officers periodically patrol these properties as they do other public lands. Contracts run one to five years in length and are very simple and straightforward. Although it rarely happens, participating landowners can withdraw from the program at any time, and those that do would receive a prorated payment. As many of you know, the vast majority of Nebraska is in private ownership, and this poses many challenges for our state's hunters and anglers. Lack of access to private land is considered one of the primary barriers to hunter participation. The OFW program started back in 2009 and has been gaining popularity. OFW is really a win-win for both landowners and hunters alike. Landowners can earn extra income on their land and in turn, hunters who help fund the program have more places to hunt. This program has grown substantially in recent years. Since 2016, we've added over 138,000 acres to the program. Over 850 landowners currently participate in OFW and they have enrolled over 373,000 acres statewide, which is at an all-time high. Increasing access to private lands is crucial to recruiting, retaining, and reactivating hunters in Nebraska. Providing places for people to hunt and fish helps ensure our long-standing traditions are passed on to future generations. For more information about the Game and Parks Open Fields and Waters program, please visit our website at OutdoorNebraska.org backslash OFW. The Nebraska Game and Parks recently approved the Berger and Pheasant Plan 2.0, which focuses on improving habitat and increasing public access within specific areas of the state. Within the six priority areas identified in the plan, which are shown here, landowners are eligible for additional financial incentives associated with enrollment in the Conservation Reserve Program. This includes CRP sign-up bonuses for both new and re-enrolled CRP, as well as CRP management incentives designed to help offset some of the costs associated with your CRP seedings and other management activities that may be required on your CRP acres. These financial incentives vary by priority area, so please contact a wildlife biologist at your nearest Game and Parks district office or service center for more information. Contact information for these offices can be found at OutdoorNebraska.org backslash locations. Thanks for joining us today. If you still have questions about CRP, we invite you to attend one of three upcoming Q&A sessions on Zoom. Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever of Nebraska, in collaboration with their conservation partners, are hosting online meetings to help answer your questions about the Conservation Reserve Program. Simply fill out a registration form for the meeting you'd like to attend, and we'll send you a meeting link to join us. If you're ready to take the next step to conserve the good life of our Nebraska farmlands, contact your local USDA service center. Remember, offers can only be accepted during the enrollment period. You have until March 11 to submit an offer for the general CRP signup and May 13 is the deadline for grassland CRP.